Uh, hello, everyone. This is the January Public Forum uh, de demo debate on the topic resolved. The United States federal government should legalize all illicit drugs. Uh, speaking first on the affirmative, we have um, Tejas Balaji and Arnab Sark Sarkar. And speaking second on the negative will be Alyssa McCartan and Conrad Poor. All right. For we affirm in contention one is cartels. Cartel violence is escalating around the globe. The CFR 21 risks that authorities have been waging a deadly battle against cartels for more than a decade, but with limited success. Drug trafficking groups dominate the import and distribution of numerous drugs in the U.S. Sala 19 furthers that drug trafficking has been the fuel for violence for decades, especially given its ability to provide economic resources for internal conflict. There are two ways that legalization would reduce drug trafficking. First is by creating competition. Coin17 writes that in a legal market for drugs, new entrants could more easily penetrate the market. Monopoly power would be eroded. As such, cartels would be unlikely to form and would be impossible to maintain. Block20 corroborates that the only way to undermine drug cartels is to legalize. They will have no specialization nor comparative advantage. Their most remunerative activity will have been taken away. With one stroke, they will be severely weakened. Second is by cutting into their pocketbooks. Lopez 15 writes that since drugs are so lucrative, an alternative to continuing the crackdown is then to legalize. Move drugs from the black market to the legal market, removing an enormous source of revenues for criminal organizations. It could severely weaken them and make them more manageable. The impact is violence. Cartels are a catalyst for state instability. Pedigo 12 writes that the drug trade is fueled by demand from the US. Cartel power is the principal catalyst for Mexico's descent towards state failure. State failure is an imminent threat, but it is not inevitable. Full legalization in the US would completely change the dynamic. And stopping the violence as soon as possible is imperative as McV18 quantifies that drug trafficking left 220,000 people dead and nearly 6 million displaced. Contention two is mass incarceration. According to the DPA 15, the US is less than 5% of the world's population, but nearly 25% of its incarcerated population, imprisoning more people than any other nation in the world, largely due to the war on drugs. The DPA continues that there were more than 1.5 million drug arrests in the US in 2013, more than 80% were per possession only. Worryingly, the problem is only getting worse as the DPA finds that about 500,000 Americans are behind bars on any given night for a drug law violation, 10 times the total in 1980. Luckily, affirming the resolution and legalizing drugs would significantly reduce the prison population in the US. The impacts are twofold. First is poverty. According to the CCC, a year after re release, 60% of formerly incarcerated people remain unemployed as those with a criminal record are much less likely to gain employment. Furthermore, those with a criminal record are completely barred from receiving cash assistance, SNAP, and housing assistance, preventing any chance of recovery. The problem is cyclical, as Benici21 finds that in the U.S., 76.6% of prisoners are rearrested within five years. These detrimental effects of incarceration drive income inequality, as Garwar20 writes that the effect of prisons is a 52% reduction in annual earnings and little earnings growth for the rest of their lives, amounting to a loss of $500,000 over several decades. Thus, the CCC concludes that if not for the rise in incarceration, the number of people in poverty would fall by as much as 20%. The second impact is Black voter disenfranchisement. A war, the war on drugs disproportionately targets Black Americans. According to the DPA, Black people comprise 13% of the U.S. population and are consistently documented by the U.S. government to use drugs at similar rates of people to other races. But Black people compromise 40% of those incarcerated in state or federal prisons for drug law violations. This results in voter disenfranchisement, as Schroeder 18 writes, that an estimated 1 in 13 Black Americans do not have the right to vote due to past convictions, four times the rate of other Americans. The consequences of Black voter disenfranchisement are disastrous, as Mitchell 21 finds that elected officials are only accountable to those who vote. So an electorate that skews richer and whiter than the country overall results in policymakers who are more responsive to the concerns of privileged citizens. Thus, a system that empowers Black citizens to vote would result in more equitable policies. Mitchell continues that a number of studies find a causal link between the more egalitarian voting rates and more generous state income support programs, higher minimum wage, and less income inequality. This is empirically verified as, quote, by reducing discrimination against Black Americans at the polls, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 reduced the Black-white black -white wage divide. Thus, we affirm. I will begin my speech now. We negate the, res the resolution resolved the United States federal government should legalize all illicit drugs. Contention one is international treaties. Current U.S. policy is sufficiently compliant with the single convention, but broad legalization breaks the perception of U.S. adherence to, to commitments on international drug treaties. Bennett 14 explains that if Colorado and Washington do uh, 
do make fundamental changes in marijuana law, then the United States regarding its drug policy obligations will need to measure up to the requirements of international law. The US assertion of its treaty compliance on the basis of flexible interpretation can be widely questioned. This undermines the stability of the entire international treaty system. Rowley Taylor 03 writes that disregarding all or selected components of treaties raises serious issues beyond the realm of drug control. The possibility of nations unilaterally ignoring drug control treaty commitments could threaten the stability of the entire treaty system. The impact is international chaos. Koplau 12 writes that other countries may mimic this, dis this disregard for legal commitments and justify their own cavalier attitudes towards international law by citing U.S. precedents. Noncompliance sullies the nation's reputation and degrades U.S. diplomats' ability to drive other states to better conform with their obligations under the full array of treaties and other international law commitments from trade to human rights to the law of the sea. Breakdown of international law triggers a litany of impacts. Schaefer 12 writes that power fragments in states holding nuclear weapons destabilize, risking nuclear proliferation and terrorist use. Climate change intensifies, fisheries deplete, deserts expand, and aquifers diminish. International law can be viewed as an intermediate public good that facilitates the production of final substantive public goods. Contention too is overconsumption. The legalization of drugs leads to an increase in consumption, and this is true for two reasons. The first is price decreases. Drug legalization will open up the market, eliminating the current illegal drug distribution monopoly. Will 12 of the Washington Post explains that in the example of marijuana, legalized marijuana could be produced for much less than a tenth of its current price as an illegal commodity and would sell for a tiny percentage of their current prices. With price decreases, consumption will go up. Mineta 12 of the Office of Drug of National Drug Policy finds that current marijuana prohibitions raise the cost of production by at least 400%. The resulting higher prices help hold down rates of usage. Usage Consumption patterns for marijuana, cigarettes, and alcohol are all known to be sensitive to price changes. Um, research has shown that a 10% drop in price yields a 7 to 8% increase in demand. The implication is on a broader level, legalization of all drugs will only increase demand for not only drugs like marijuana, but harder drugs like cocaine, um, heroin, and methamphetamine. Second is marketing. Legalization is co-opted by pharmaceutical companies who use misleading marketing and to increase consumption. The opioid crisis in the U.S. proves how deadly this can be. Lopez 17 of Vox writes that in the 1990s and 2000s, as drug, drug companies mislead Leaningly marketed opioids to treat chronic pain. Companies got a hold of dangerous, addictive products and marketed it irresponsibly. As a result, people got addicted and died. Empirically, the legalization of substances in the past have empirically resulted in, in more consumption. STARS 16 of Brookings finds that drug legalization would lead to an immediate and substantial rise in consumption. The prevalence of heroin, opioids, and cocaine addictions in various countries before international controls took effect, the rise in alcohol consumption after the Volstead Act was repealed in the U.S., and studies showing higher rates of abuse among medical professionals with greater access to prescription drugs prove this to be true. The impact of consumption is a public health ep ep epidemic. Stories, uh, SARS 696 of Brookings explains that increases would translate to drug overdoses, de deformities, um, loss of productivity, child abuse, and other crimes. Indeed, Lopez 17 finds that more than uh, 560,000 560, people in the U.S. have died of drug overdoses between 1990 and 2015. For these reasons, we urge you to negate. Okay. Um, are we all good for cross? Yes. Okay. So um, could I have the first question? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm a little confused on the second link on C2. Why would people get more addicted to drugs like methamphetamine and, and opioids if it's not because of a price decrease? Well, like basically what our second warrant is saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so our second warrant is talking about marketing. And so when drugs become legalized, you know, when you're like watching TV and there's like a ton of commercials for drugs, sure. essentially that's the sort of thing that would start happening when these drugs are now legalized. And we say that's a problem because when consumers are constantly being drilled into their mind that they need these sorts of medications, they ask their doctor for it, doctors are more likely to prescribe it. And it just means that usage goes up. May I ask a question? Sure. Um, so on your point about mass incarceration, what is the root cause of, of mass incarceration in the US? Racist policy making, probably. Okay, and so is that gonna go away if like illicit drugs are legalized? Yeah, 
like our second link says that that or our second impact is all about how um, you know it's more likely to cause like things like egalitarian policy, make more equitable policy decisions because um, representatives are held accountable to the voters that vote for them, and if black voters are not okay. So how is that different from like decriminalization though? Like wouldn't that also garner the same benefits? Sure, but. I don't know, are you going to say that there's decriminalization of all illicit drugs happening now? Like No, but I'm just saying, like, why is the affirmative world the only world in which you can access these benefits? Well, the affirmative world is a world in which you access the benefits. I don't know why we shouldn't access those benefits. Well, we what we would tell you is that in the status quo, states are moving to decriminalize lots of drugs. And so these benefits are already occurring right now. Yeah, but not really, because the states that it matters in, they're never going to legalize all illicit drugs because policy- well, We're not talking about legalization. We're just talking about- decriminal. Yeah, but the states, like, could you name a state, maybe a swing state or states that have like really big um, stake in polls that are decriminalizing drugs right now? Yeah, like a lot of red states actually have decriminalized. I don't want to misstate, but I think like Montana did in the most recent election right, well, I mean, because Montana. it's a ballot. It's like a public referendum ballot measure. Yeah, so. but Montana doesn't have a big stake in national elections. Like the policymakers that don't want black voters to have a voice will never decriminalize or legalize drugs, which is why a national precedent is important. Can I get a question? Sure. So I want to talk to you about your first contention on treaties. The U.S. violates international treaties all the time. Why are the three treaties that the, um, like the prohibition of drugs affect going to necessarily spill over and cause like massive big impact scenarios like the ones you read? Yeah, so what we would tell you is that um, like the drug issue specifically is an issue that very much impacts like several different countries like the drug trade is not just like specific to the United States. And so mm -hmm. as a result of that, because these like conventions are like widely, I guess, applicable and have a very dramatic impact on like inter-country relations that will, that makes it have a, a more pronounced effect than other sorts of international conventions. So the, wait, could you explain why it's so bad? Like why is it, why are drugs the main reason? Like drugs particularly? Well, I'm saying like this, the policy is like something that is like very widely applicable because like all countries are basically touched by the drug trade. I'm ready to go unless uh, or not you want to take prep to tell me anything. Okay. Um, in that case, my time starts now. Let's start on their first contention about international treaties. The reason why nobody talks about this argument on the war on drugs debate is because it's not true. For example, when you look at Panic or 15, we find that the legalization of marijuana by countries such as Netherlands, US states such as California, or the decriminalization of all drugs by Portugal in 2001 have already conflicted with international treaties, but you never saw any of their impacts manifest. Don't let them come up here and tell you that the states doing this isn't the same as the federal government doing this, because under the supremacy clause, we still see international treaties as supreme to state laws, meaning that if the US government actually cared about these treaties at all, then they wouldn't have let the states pass these policies in the first place. But secondly, we would say that even if their impact does trigger, there's no spillover, because COPLA 13 finds that we have violated international binding treaties so many times that there's never been any collapse. It's also been far more egregious than drug policies. In fact, we violated the Chemical Weapons Convention of 1993, which is far more prevalent to things like proliferation than drug policy and none of their impacts ever manifested. There's no reason as to why it'll happen now. Indeed, there's no warrant as to why drugs are key. They just say that lots of people are affected by drug trades, but lots of countries are also affected by international treaties. I mean, they're literally international. There's no reason as to why drugs are key to their argument. But even then, their impact is so unclear that there's no way to weigh it. They just say things like proliferation, but they never tell you why that's bad, why that's going to cause war, or who's actually going to be affected. At that point, let's go over to their second contention about consumption. There are a lot of problems with this argument. Overall, our narrative is that no matter what, drug consumption is always going to exist. It's going up in the status quo, meaning that the status quo isn't working. At that point, illegally, people can get their hands on whatever drugs. Thus, legalizing drugs is actually a better way of combating the problem because we're focused more on harm reduction than punishment. There's a lot of reasons for this. Firstly, the argument that you can just, uh, firstly, um, the argument that drug consumption goes up at all isn't true. Like, 
just based on empirics because of how easy it is to get drugs right now anyways. For example, ABC News finds that recreational pot, despite becoming legal for Americans, hasn't increased the use of marijuana use. The Journal of American Medical Association found that there was no increase in cannabis use among the general population or among previous users after states legalized marijuana. But then on the price reduction argument, it's not even true because the government puts increasingly high taxes on drugs. If anything, this is another reason as to why people don't go to the drug markets because illegal drug markets are completely collapsed and it's more expensive now because of high taxes, meaning that people don't want to, this is just another incentive as to why people don't use drugs in our world. But then let's go over to the second warrant about marketing. This doesn't really make any sense either because the entirety of their argument is based on the opiate crisis. They've non-uniqued their own argument because as Corbett 18 uh, argues, insurance companies already provide easy access to addictive opiates while restricting alternatives. That's why 20% of people given a 10 day opiate prescription continue using after a year. And moreover, opiates are the deadliest drug type. At least one type of opiate is a factor in 71.76% of overdoses. At that point, the brunt of their impacts comes from opiates. Opiates are already legal. Overprescription by the government is the reason as to why opiate use is increasing. At that point, why do we solve? It's because Winkleman 14 finds that things like psychedelics, such as LSD and psilocybin, have a small risk of abuse or mortality. In fact, they have the ability to treat SUDs. John Hopkins 14 found that psilocybin produced an 80% absence rate from tobacco compared to a 35% from vernicillin, which is widely considered the most effective anti-tobacco drug. At that point, if we legalize these substances, we have better alternatives. Moreover, Brookings 96 finds that with legalization, governments could abandon costly and futile efforts to suppress the supply of drugs and instead put it in money to educate people and treat them. Secondly, marketing doesn't even happen because, for example, we banned that with big tobacco. The government with legalization has the ability to control commercialization. You prefer all our turns on uniqueness because you've seen drug debts go up by 28% in the last year. For those reasons, we're very proud to affirm. All right. So if everyone's ready, the order is going to be starting with the uh, negative case um, and then going to the affirmative case, starting with, with the first contention. Start with my first contention. They make a couple of responses in regards to treaties. The fact that other countries already violate international treaties. They need to give like what examples. They say Netherlands, Portugal, and even the state of California have legalized drugs with no repercussions. Our response to that is that those countries are not as important as the United States. The United States is the single biggest power in all of the world. And our evidence speculates that the United States use of uh, uh, or legalization of all drugs would in, would undermine the entire international treaty system because of the United States power and its role in the world economy. Go to my second contention. They make a couple of responses. Their first response is, is that marijuana use didn't empirically increase. We're going to have two responses. My first response is that Merkin 16 finds that that's empirically not true in the context of marijuana, finding that significant increases in consumption in Colorado and Washington State. But secondly, and perhaps most importantly, Rivermind Health reports that looking at a national level, the use of marijuana due to the changing social factors and 31 states legalizing marijuana for even me me uh, medical use had resulted in doubling of marijuana use on a national level, proving their argument isn't true. Their next response says that taxes on drugs means that costs don't decrease. Or, I mean, that, or our Will 12 evidence answers this by saying that even if there is taxes, there's a significant decrease in the cost of drugs due to the supply chain efficiencies of creating drugs on a massive scale and for things like large pharmaceutical companies, proving that the cost has decreased. And you can look at marijuana as an example. The second uh, this, the next response they say is that the majority of our impacts are stemming from opium deaths. And, and yes, that is correct. And our, our, our examples are proving why legal use of drugs, particularly our second link, and the marketing done by pharmaceutical companies is the reason why there's abuse. My opponents give the example that, oh, they'll just switch to things like psychedelic drugs. There's no guarantee that this would happen. In fact, they would likely just switch to things like cocaine or heroin, even further perpetuating a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of our impacts only marketing these things and only increasing consumption drastically additionally the studies that say that psychedelics are beneficial are looking at it in a very specific context a clinical context legalization on a broader level will result in self-diagnosis and abuse of these drugs like psychedelics and psilocybin and negating any benefit go to my opponent's case 
And the first contention they have about cartels, we're going to have a number of responses. My first response to their argument is that this argument is non-unique. Bender 13 explains that Mexican drug cartels would still exist in a world where, in which the United States legalizes drugs by just increasing drug sales internationally in places such as Canada. My second response is you can turn the argument. You can't put Pandora back in its box. Even if their economic theory that, that cartels wouldn't form in a competitive market ignores the fact that cartels exist today. Any attempt to implement competition into a market that's already established will increase violence. My third response is you can turn the argument against them once again. Cartels are adaptive. Cutting into drug profits car cause cartels to compensate by turning into more violence. Bender 13 finds is that in response to declining marijuana revenue, cartels increased the amount of money that they, they got from kidnapping, human trafficking, and sex trafficking, proving that violence only increases. Go to my opponent's second contention. My first response is that this argument is non-unique. Mass incarceration is ending in the status quo. Quinta 21 explains that the root cause of, of mass incarceration was marijuana-related arrests. At already, 32 states have legalized marijuana, proving that their impact is being solved for. My second response is that full decriminalization is happening too. Quinta 21 finds that four states have passed decriminalization methods with several states to follow in 2022 and 2024. The implication is that the status quo is in the direction of solving their impacts. Even if they prove that all states don't pass mass incarceration, mass incarceration is a thing of, of the past. State by state decriminalization is far more preferable than federal legalization because federal legalization triggers the impacts we mentioned in our case, such as overall overconsumption of drugs. Well, we can avoid all the harms of mass incarceration that they've already have identified in their case by just continuing the status quo um, on a state by state le a level. And the fact that the majority of states have already legalized marijuana, and that's the root cause of mass incarceration. So on um, your case, you say something about how um, marijuana has increased or usage of marijuana has increased in states like Colorado and um, in places like but then on my case, you say that state by state is better because increase in use only happens under federal legalization. I'm yeah. kind of confused. So I think that's an important differentiation. I'm glad you brought it up. Is that the topic isn't saying federal legalization of marijuana. The topic is saying the legalization of all drugs. Our arguments talk about how the legalization of all drugs would lead into an increase in consumption of all drugs, which are bad, like things no, no, like no, cocaine, that, th this heroin, This isn't answering my fentanyl. question, right? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm asking specifically about the marijuana example, because I said that marijuana use hasn't gone up, correct? And then you said that, no, 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 marijuana use has gone up in places like Colorado and D.C. But then on... Um, I believe yeah. our case, you then later say that overconsumption would only be realized under a federal legalization. So this is an obvious drugs. contradiction. Overconsumption of all drugs like heroin and cocaine. Not, not, you could, we could okay, say then that. Why, why, why bring up the marijuana, marijuana example happens. on the other side? Because your, your specific empiric example as to why drug use increases at all is under the context of marijuana legalization and it's under the context of state by state no, that's legalization. an example our evidence stipulates that the drug consumption would increase for all drugs especially abusive drugs like heroin and, and cocaine which are a lot more addictive and a lot more potentially deadly and what's cause, heroin cause a lot like more, what is heroin what what is heroin um so heroin is a form of an opium um what is heroin use. derived from um I, I don't know. It's derived from morphine, and morphine is legal. Why do people use heroin in the first place? Um, because they have some kind of lingering pain, I guess. I don't know the exactly. The reason why reasons. people use heroin yeah. instead of just morphine is because the state or like the, the insurance companies in the status quo already get them addicted to it. So then they later yeah. switch to things is, like this heroin, is, this which is, is often point. impure, and they die because it has like fentanyl this in it. This is our point, Tejas. Like, your whole point that that pharmaceutical companies are bad that gets people hooked on illegal drugs is the exact reason why we shouldn't legalize drugs on a federal level. This gateway would only increase if you allow them to not just like market kind of like the things that get them into heroin, but let them market heroin itself. Right. Nobody is like product. marketing heroin or even like opiates on like the sense That's of marketing argument. that you're talking about. But my point is that if this problem of opiates being abused is already a thing, what would we what would be better? right would it be better for people to use like those opiates that at the very least we know that they're pure and we know that you can't overdose from them or um, would we have we, them rather go to the streets and buy fentanyl and then die because it's like twice as more likely that you overdose from fentanyl than heroin 
Well, if you start doing a heroin because it's legalized, fentanyl would also be legalized under your world. It's all but legalization fentanyl is of all an drugs. impure like thing that people don't even know is in heroin half the time, which is why they die. Okay, that's time. Okay, so if everyone's good, I'm going to start on um, the negative case and then go to the affirmative case. Okay. Let's start on their trees arguments. Conrad drops two pieces of defense that kills that contention. The first one is that they have no clear impact, not weighable, not winnable. The second one is that they don't give a unique reason why drugs are key as a treaty, which means that they're, none of their warrants extrapolate why drugs, unlike other treaties that we've broken, like chemical treaties, would uniquely cause the impact, no place to vote there. Let's go to their C2, a bunch of problems. The first response you can extend is the ABC response that says that empirically there has not been an increase in overconsumption as proven by marijuana. They make two responses. First is this Merkin evidence that says that empirically in two states, there was an increase in usage. Okay, that's two states. Our ABC evidence is much more preferable. It's nationwide. Second, they say that weed usage increased because of things like social and medical reasons. Yeah, when you legalize drugs, there's going to be an increase in usage for those things, but they have to win that there's an abuse of those drugs, an overconsumption of those drugs, not an expected consumption of those drugs, which means that our defense on their link still is there. There is not an un unexpected increase in overconsumption. There's an expected one for medical things. This is why you can go to our turn about psychedelics. They make one response. They just say that people will swap to things like cocaine and heroin instead of psychedelics. No warrant. Conrad just asserts that. Extend the term. Psychedelics are much better than things like opioids, and they're more likely to solve back for all the issues that they talk about in their impact scenario. They're 80% more likely to solve things like tobacco addiction compared to the alternatives. The second thing they say is that people will self-diagnose. Again, with no warrant, Conrad just asserts these things. He has to give a warrant for why this is true. We say that doctors prove that these things are far more accessible and far more likely to cure diseases, which is why they would prescribe them. That's the warrant that we give. You can also extend the second term, clean drop that education education programs would be invested into by the government, which would make it more likely to overcome consumption wouldn't happen in the first place. Automatically, that means that there is low likelihood of their impact scenario and we're more likely to solve for it because when drugs are legalized, the government is more comfortable to pass policies like those ones. Let's go to our case. We're going for our cartels argument. They make three responses. The first thing they say is that it's non-unique because cartels exist and they increase the amount of uh, like other kinds of violence that they're doing. We say that the U.S., the U.S. is the most likely one to compete with these, with all, uh, with like the increase in violence, which is why there's a low likelihood that there's international violence in the future because they don't have the money to compete. They don't have the money to commit crimes like that. The second thing they say is cartels exist right now. Yes, because they swap to alternative drugs. When you legalize all drugs, they can't go from cocaine to heroin to a new drug. All the illicit drugs are legalized. Then they say that cartels will adapt to other forms of violence. They can only commit those alternative forms of violence if they or if if they have money to do it. We say that all their funding gets cut away, which is why cartels reduce violence and are evidence is much better on this because McLeavy finds that there's a six per, like six million people have been displaced by these cartels and we can solve that as Lopez finds that they, there's a reduction in revenue only when you allow, eradicate the amount of illicit drugs or uh, legalize the illicit drugs in the U.S. You can weigh this argument in two ways. First is on scope. Our impact impacts multiple countries around the world like Mexico and Colombia whereas theirs are only specific to the U.S. Second is on is on magnitude. Our impact is six million people that are displaced. You don't know how many people are affected by the health crisis. How many people are going to die from this international treaty breakdown scenario. The only other response they have that maybe non-unique to the debate is the four states are legalizing right now. But our link is particularly different because we need legalization to allow companies to compete with the drug trade. But decriminalization, non-unique is their argument because only when there's decriminalization can people consume whatever drugs they want. But legalization allows for companies to start competing, which is why that response, non-unique is their case, but not ours. Okay, um, let's see, let me get my timer. Um, it's going to start on my case and then go to the AF case. Is everyone ready? Okay, let's begin. You're voting for us on our second contention about overconsumption. What we tell you in our case is that prices are going to go down because the monopolization of the drug industry will no longer exist. And that means with lower prices, people will access more drugs and consumption will, will go up. We next tell you that there's going to be increase in pharmaceutical marketing, and that's going to invite more people to want to try drugs, again, increasing consumption. My opponents have a couple responses. Their first response is that we did not see an increase in consumption of weed when it was uh, legalized in certain states. A couple problems with this. One, they ignore our river health evidence, which literally says we saw two times increased use on the national level. But even if you don't buy that, they just say that that there's going to be some increase because people are using this using drugs in a medical context. Well, 
a couple responses to this. Number one, addictive drugs, even if it is prescribed in a medical context, by nature of them being addictive, means that more and more people are going to be using them over time and using more and more of the drugs themselves. It might be true for weed that like overconsumption didn't increase to a huge extent because weed is not addictive, but with the other illicit drugs we're talking about right now, this will apply and it will be very catastrophic for people. Next, my opponents try to argue that psychedelics are going to solve back for all of these harms. They don't respond to my partner's response from rebuttal, which tells you that the psychedelic effects that they're citing are only from clinical studies and are not from recreational use. What we tell you in our second warrant is when advertising is and marketing is going to reach people across the country, more and more people will start using drugs like psychedelics or other drugs for recreational purposes. And that means that they're going to be in an unregulated setting where people can die, where people be, can become easily addicted. Finally, my opponents say that there are other types of more beneficial investments that like will occur if we legalize, if we legalize um, illicit substances, they give no warrant for this whatsoever. And it's new in their summary speech. The reason why you're voting for us on this argument is we tell you that with opioids alone, 56,000 people have died over the past few years. That's just with one type of drug. We tell you that this goes on a whole larger scale when you legalize all illicit drugs, which are highly addictive. Go to my opponent's case on cartels. A couple problems here. Number one, what, what, what Number one, my opponents don't adequately answer our response where we tell you that drugs, that cartels are just going to switch to other international markets. They say only the United States is a market they can compete with. No, we tell you there, there's drug markets everywhere. They can easily go to other countries like Canada. But next, my opponents try to tell you that like, oh, uh, that they won't have enough money to actually make this switch into like more, more harmful industries. What we tell you is because they lose money because they're no longer able to compete in the drug market, that means they have to go into other more violent industries in order to make money. That's why we've seen empirically that they are going to turn to industries such as human trafficking, which have damaging effects for, for people's lives and are, and are extremely violent. The reason why you're preferring our, our argument over my opponent's argument is we've seen what it was, we've seen, um, we've seen what has happened with the opioid crisis. And we know that if that happened with one drug, you're just going to increase that, um, that effect and those number of overdose deaths through all sorts of illicit drugs. And for these reasons, we urge you to negate. Awesome. Y'all right. want the first question? Sure. Arno, do you want to take it? Sure. Um, so let's talk about the uh, overconsumption argument. So um, the response that you make is that, uh, like the first thing is that there is a uh, like increase in the use of these drugs because like they're naturally addictive and then you said like drugs that have been legalized in the past like weed weren't addictive so what is an example of a drug that's maybe been legalized and has been abused because we opioids that you opioids is like the the core example like sure. that'll happen with heroin okay heroin is literally derived from legal opioids a yeah. and b yeah, if you, that, that heroin itself is illegal seated, that 72 percent of your impact is from drugs that according to you are already legal like from where are you even deriving an impact these are our examples, oh, we're, we're, right if the problem with a lot of the drugs that you've identified is that they're legalized and the reason why they're so like problematic is because there's pharmaceutical companies like you know purdue pharma and other huge pharmaceutical companies that push these drugs through aggressive marketing campaigns. That's going to happen with drugs like, like cocaine or uh, methamphetamine or, th or things like that through legal channels. Why, right. why would it be those? Amphetamines are also already legal. Like Adderall is just pharmaceutical meth. Well, well, like why would it be those drugs? I guess I'm like curious why it's those drugs. Was my yeah, question. I think this, this actually trans uh, translates into the other question that that you all keep bringing up in this debate is the transition to psychedelic drugs as opposed yeah. to other types of drugs. So on the, the studies that you cite that there were like an 80% decrease in tobacco addictiveness, what's the context of the study? Like, like where did these studies happen? Okay, just cut it. Um, yeah, sure. So like, this is like a John Hopkins study of yeah. like- So at, at Johns Hopkins, it, like the, they, they clinically administered psilocybin, which is like magic mushrooms, and they combined it with like psychotherapy and other, you know, initiatives like in a lab setting. The paper even cites that they don't like recreationally endorse people taking 
these psychedelic drugs. Conrad, there's two problems with this, right? A, the scheduling of the drug makes it almost impossible for these drugs to be administered in clinical environments anyways. So sure, maybe you're right that they shouldn't be like abused recreationally, but even the clinical administration can't happen unless you legalize. And B, psilocybin is not addictive and doesn't have essentially like any negatives unless you're taking like it, it 20 does have a lot grams of, negatives. of mushrooms People can have like, like psych uh, psychological breaks through taking certain psychedelics yeah, if you take like a heroic dose like every single day when you're like seven but well, what like we're telling you is because no, like because it will be so easily accessible because of price drops and because people will want to try new drugs when they're like targeted through marketing initiatives then all of those so sorts of abusive situations can happen so, so why you're does saying that, that still happen even with the non-unique that you read like you said drugs are being decriminalized everywhere why wouldn't people abuse these yeah drugs? so there's a big oh. difference between decriminalization and legalization in the sense sure. that legal Legalization allows for the marketing of these drugs. Decriminalization means you won't go to prison if you're found with these in your possession. That's the no, distinction. But people who are addicted to the drugs will keep That's buying tough. them regardless of how expensive they are. If they're if drugs are being decriminalized state by state, which you even say, why wouldn't there still be a public health crisis? Consumption people increases because of the marketing and price decreases associated with legalization, not decriminalization. Right, but the, the, okay, you, yeah, that's time. You take a question. Oh, okay. All right. Um, starting off on the negative case. Okay, if everyone's ready, my time starts now. There is so much they've dropped on their case, it's impossible for them to win this debate. The first big piece of terminal defense that was completely conceded in the summary is the fact that they come up and tell you the decriminalization of drugs is already happening on a state-by-state basis, meaning that in the long run, their argument is completely non-unique. The only argument that this doesn't touch is our argument about cartels, because even if decriminalization happens, that doesn't allow for companies to compete against the cartels. At that point, the second big piece of terminal defense that has been completely conceded is our argument that um, it, actually, it's a turn. It's the argument that education can actually increase regarding these drugs if you affirm. That's because when the government isn't spending so many billions of dollars fighting off these drugs and trying to suppress these illicit drugs, they can put that money into actual education and drug rehabilitation. This was brought up in the rebuttal. It was a turn. It was conceded in the rebuttal. It was conceded in the summary. There's no reason as to why you shouldn't vote for this argument. It's completely clean compared to their argument. At that point, you're also weighing this against their argument too, because first, on probability, there was no increase in substance abuse uh, on marijuana. Our studies on a bigger scale, there's only on two, uh, two states. But then second is on uniqueness. Drug debts are increasing this year by 28% compared to last year. The status quo isn't solving, it's try or die. At that point, let's go over to our case. Our argument about cartels is basically conceded. We tell you that cartel violence is increasing right now and it's killing millions of people. However, if the US companies go in with legalization, they can act as competition that completely destroys the cartel's monopoly and totally destroys their pocketbooks. This prevents state failure in countries like Mexico and other South American countries. That would save millions of people because cartel violence is causing state, uh, state collapse to happen right now. Their only responses are that A, they can go to other countries. They've conceded on um, all responses which is that A, the US is the biggest market giving billions of dollars and b it it isn't even true there's like uh, it isn't even true given that like the companies can also compete with canada the second response is that there's other violent industries a there's no weighing or impact to this and b if they don't have any money they can't go into these violent industries that was also completely considered for those reasons we're extremely proud to affirm all right is everyone ready it's going to start with the pro case then going over to the con case the first major voting issue in the round is our turn and their arguments about cartels. In the last speech, Teja says is that they don't have money, they can't go into the other industries. The logic is completely reverse. It's because they lose out on their money is the reason as to why they go into these other industries in the first place. Our evidence from, from Baker specifically indicates that in response to declining profits from marijuana, drug cartels turn to increase sex trafficking, human trafficking, and uh, and kidnapping as a means to compensate for their declining revenue from drug violence. The implication is that you see a drastic increase in violence in their world. Also, the other evidence that we read that they switched to international markets, even if the U.S. is the primary supplier of, uh, of like drug revenue, they'll just compensate by going internationally, proving that these cartels never go away, and they will just switch by you know, selling drugs internationally and through increasing things like human trafficking and sex trafficking, which is an on-net increase in violence, a clear reason why you can vote for us. The second voting issue in the round is overconsumption. The first response they make in the, in the last speech is that decriminalization is happening, meaning that all of our warrants are non-unique. 
It's not though, because even if decriminalization is happening, which is what we agree to, there's a fundamental distinction between decriminalization and legalization. In a world in which decriminalization happens, you can't have pharmaceutical companies marketing cocaine and heroin to children on, you know, like the nightly news. That's not going to happen. In a world in which legalization happens, they can do that. It's legal, right? So all of their arguments that they try to make and the next turn they read about how education is going to happen is probably, you should be skeptical of this because education won't happen when there's manipulative marketing that pushes people towards addictive drugs. So at the point in which overconsumption increases, pharmaceutical companies have a profit and incentive to profit off of addictive drugs that increases the amount of deaths and causes a public health epidemic. The only other response is that in mar- like in the context of marijuana, consumption didn't increase. They say you should look at a national study. No, like you should prioritize our studies that look only at the states that legalize marijuana. That finds that when states legalize marijuana, consumption increases. Why would you look at a national study? Not all states legalize marijuana, right? That doesn't even make any sense. You should look at the states that legalized marijuana and found that there was an increase in consumption, increase in consumption of ad- addictive drugs like cocaine, like heroin, not things like psychedelics. And even if it is psychedelics, outside of a clinical context, it's not going to be beneficial. It's going to cause a public health epidemic. And for that reason, you can vote for the negative. Thanks.